My name is Dustin Kelly, but everybody calls me DJ. I'm prior Army, serving as both a Ford Observer and a military police officer. I spent the last 14 and a half years as a police officer and detective in a large metropolitan police department. Two things that I've learned throughout my career. One, everybody has a story to tell. And two, the best stories are true. This is the DTD Podcast. In three, two, one, and we're live. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the DTD Podcast. This week in the studio, my guest entered the Australian Army on a scholarship to study medicine, never knowing where his completed studies and job requirements would take him. My guest spent five years of his career splitting his time as a doctor between the SAS and the 2nd Commando Regiment. My guest has experienced four operational tours to Afghanistan, where he walked a fine line between the ability to kill the enemy on the battlefield and save those lives around him with the same hands and mindset. My guest, after leaving the Army in 2014, has held positions as a remote mine site doctor, ship doctor, medical director of the South Australian Prison Health Service, and currently works part-time in the ER of a regional hospital in between remote medical sites. He's a doctor, a special operations soldier, and an author. He's here this week to talk about having the strength to fight his demons and return to a life that he never knew was possible until his eyes were fully open to the world around him. Please welcome the voodoo medicine doctor himself, Dan Pronk. What's going on, my friend? (laughs) Hey, DJ, appreciate that uh, grandiose introduction there, my friend, and backed with some uh, some solid guitar licks. I like it. <laughs> well, uh, we've been talking for quite a while, and I'm, I'm so glad you're here. And, and there's a lot to cover because your life as a doctor and as a soldier, I don't think I've ever heard two stories, maybe not destined to be together more than yours, but they have just kind of ebbed and flowed with each other and given you the life that you have now. We always kind of start out talking early life. Um, I want to talk about your father being in the military, uh, you kind of being exposed to that life early on, your brother, of course, being a special operations soldier too. So let's go back to when you're kind of a kid. Are you always set on going to the military? Nah, the complete opposite. So my brother was destined to go into the army. The the writing was on the wall from an early age. And, you know, he was the kid that was always dressed in in poorly fitting cams that dad would bring home from work. He he had this plastic uh, M16, this AR that, that he is pretty much in every single childhood photo. He dragged this thing around. And so, I mean, the writing was on the wall early that, that Ben was heading in that direction. And indeed he did. I took a very different path. So despite those exposures, my dad being a, a career helicopter pilot with the army, and then Ben heading on this trajectory. I think uh, despite that, or maybe because of that, I, I chose a different identity in, in adolescence and never in my wildest dreams at that point could I have imagined that I'd end up in the army. You say that though, but you talk in your book, and once again, I have to tell you, it was absolutely fantastic how you kind of poured out your soul into this book because you were really honest about a lot of things. But you point out very early in your life that you were always kind of part of special operations. Maybe they were clandestine missions for stuff that was (laughs) maybe a bit of trouble, but you were always into that kind of stuff, seeing kind of how you could push the limits. I think you went to like seven schools you were expelled from one and you had the long hair the earring all that kind of stuff how was that it's such an opposite of your father and your brother how was that growing up and being kind of your own person and turning into who you did I think a lot of it, so when I trace it all back, and and it's all with hindsight after the fact, looking at how everything played out, but from an early age, there was 
a lot of a lot of I was always a fairly introverted kid. I was uh, fortunately uh, intelligent enough to get through school fine, and and it took me a while to find things that I was really interested in to apply myself to to do well. So I didn't do well at school. That wasn't through lack of intelligence. Uh, you know, thankfully it was just I, I didn't apply myself. And you know, I'm the textbook kid, as I imagine a lot of people listening are that had that. You know, Dan Dan chose potential, but he's not working to the best of his ability type thing and and with hindsight and it, it took years later for uh, actually one of the army special operations psychologists to to label this but I, I had this sensation seeking personality type I, I I tended to want to push myself to push boundaries to, to test myself there was this innate desire that wanted to just try and fulfill my potential and initially that was was in well the pushing the boundaries and stuff was in the usual teenage uh, rebellion type things. I, I found a lot of stimulation in in kind of sneaking out my bedroom window at night and and racing around town, spray painting coal trains and public toilets. And and graffiti was a great outlet for me, and and an artistic outlet. I was quite an artistic kid, and but the the stimulus of being doing something that I knew was a bit risky and a bit wrong uh, really appealed to me. I. Um, so with hindsight, there was that personality uh, trait there that, that craved excitement, it craved stimulus. Indeed, to this day, my values are very heavily skewed towards uh, stimulus seeking and novelty and, and, and now more far more controlled risk taking. But uh, that's something that excites me. And then there was this drive to try and be the best version of myself. And, and I, I think a lot of that was... Uh, innate just plumbed into me. I think it, there was a lot of uh, my dad and my mum, for that matter, very good role models in showing us that that anything's probably anything's possible. And dad used to tell us, my brother and I, this all the time that if someone's doing it, then you can do it too. You just got to work out how and work your ass off at it. And so we got dealt the genetics. We were good. My brother and I were both good enough mentally and physically to pretty much pursue ambitious goals in whatever direction we wanted that to head. And so initially I, I took that in the, the um, physical realm, in the sporting realm. I chased the professional triathlon circuit for a few years. And then my life took a pretty abrupt turn in my early 20s. And that was when, for the first time ever, it made sense to join the army. Was there ever any friction between you and your brother being such opposite lifestyles? Because th let me explain why I asked that question. Because in reading the book, there seems that there is a closeness, a brother closeness with you two, but it seems very delineated and that there are very much lines drawn, I guess you would say, in the sand, especially when you went over to special operations because you guys only crossed paths one time. There wasn't anything that he really told you about it. Was there ever friction or did you guys get along? Am I just reading it completely wrong out of the book? No, you're reading that correctly. The, so we were very close together. So 15 months apart in age. My, my brother is older than me, but very close together. So only ever a grade apart at school or two grades, depending on when we moved into state. And, and so as little kids, we were best of buddies. You know, we grew up thick as thieves and, and uh, best mates into our teenage years. I think as is the natural tendency is to start to develop your own personality and identity and and ben was was headed i mean he had his rebellious streak and and all the rest of it but but he was far more uh he was far more studious he did very well at school he got the you know the top mark you can get on exiting school he got a, a scholarship to go to the defense force academy to become an officer and so he was a, a little bit more um he, he was a bit more, I guess, straight down the line and headed in a particular life path and, and I deviated. And so in our adolescence, we we did uh, sort of the, the relationship drifted apart a little bit as we formed our own adult identities. And then, as you mentioned, DJ, the, the just as fate would have it, despite over that five year period where we were both serving within special operations, we, we never served together. 
the the and, and as you said, I, I only ever saw him professionally one time for a fleeting moment during all of that, and that was on my SAS selection course. So we're trying to keep us apart, and I just had a chance interaction. We didn't say any words. We just passed one another. You know, in the middle of the night, I was actually racing to the dunny before uh, the next activity, and and he was coming out of a, another thing. But but um, so I think that was probably a good thing. But the certainly in life since then uh we've been we've come right back together so you know he's my he's my best mate as an adult we're business partners in a, a company called the resilient shield which as the name suggests all about resilience based on our uh, previous roles and and research into it so yeah we sort of drifted apart during adolescence we lived very independent lives in our early adulthood were just just as fate dictated, were, were, were kept apart from one another during our military careers and then have come back together post-military. So let's unpack that a little more then, because I, I guess I was reading into it correctly. Say you guys are thick as thieves. Do you think your career or your military persona that you built up, is it different if you guys are close? Yeah, I mean, we had very different experiences in the military. So Ben had gone through as a, an officer, he went into infantry, junior officer with a, a regular infantry battalion, did a trip to East Timor, as it was called at the time, as a junior lieutenant with our army, and and then did SAS selection, went in as a, initially a, a troop commander, then a squadron commander, then ultimately the commanding officer of that unit over his career. There was bits and pieces in between those postings. But I, I had gone in as a doctor. So I, I studied medicine on a military scholarship. I was an officer as well, but went through a very different abbreviated officer training pipeline to someone like Ben, who was, was having a, a more formal leadership role within the military. And But it was definitely, there was definitely an influence there because it was through Ben's involvement with the SAS regiment that I became aware of Army Special Operations. And so he was fundamental to me ending up doing what I was doing, but we had very different experiences as, as working with special operations, him as that, those varying levels of officer and me as a, a doctor with special operations units. As you go into the military, you know, usually you talk, you, you went in in 2001. A lot of people talk when you talk to people from the United States and they say they went in because uh, the United States was attacked. Uh, they felt very patriotic. I have a feeling it was a little different for you, not only because of the past and, you know, not being directed towards that, what was the real reason that you went into the military? What was that thing that, that shifted your life to make you go, okay, that's the thing I need to do? Look, it's a little embarrassing to, to reflect on that, but it was basically a, a free medical schooling. It was the, the cash was the one of the primary motivators. And it was a bit of a, a kind of, you know, what do I do now after this, this dream of being a professional triathlete had it had become clear that I wasn't going to achieve that. I just wasn't good enough, plain and simple. I, I was training with the best in the world. I was doing exactly what they were doing and I'd go to races and I was just making up numbers. And there was a younger generation coming through that was starting to beat me. I was in my early 20s up to age 23. There was these 17, 18 year old uh, prodigies coming through that were, were starting to beat me. So the writing was on the wall that that wasn't, going to be a realistic career uh, goal for me. And that was when that was, but I've been so invested in that as a career and that as an identity. And, and so that period of time, which was the year 2000, where it became really clear that, that I wasn't going to make it, was a, a really deep period of, of soul searching and kind of, well, what do I do now? I'd, I'd done some study part time. So I did an exercise science degree part-time over about five years. And I, I quite liked that, the human movements, all the anatomy, the physiology. So I started to think, well, maybe medicine might be a thing for me if I was capable of getting into it. And then I sort of, sort of started to look at, for the first time, realistically, as a young adult, maybe this army thing, maybe there's something in it. You know, dad did it, my brother did it, it's a stable career. And as I was exploring both those options, 
it became uh, clear, I think my mum made me aware of these scholarships to study medicine through the army. And I'm like, wow, that's that's for me. That's uh, this this way that I can fund this. It brings the two things together. So got myself into medicine, got myself into the army and, and sort of went to uh, really changed tack in terms of my uh, career and that was so that was the start of 2001 that I started medical school and of course as we all know the, the September 11 that year was the, the Twin Towers fell my brother was with SAS by that point and but I hadn't really taken an interest in Army Special Operations until the end of that year Australia had started sending special operations troops to Afghanistan and my brother was a troop commander at the time. He was getting ready to deploy very early in 2002 and I'd gone across to Perth where our SAS regiment is based to visit him in the Christmas holidays before he left and got this insight into what the SAS was, what the special operations was. Uh, get a bit of a, a feel for what was coming with regards to, although no one could have known, but uh, certainly this this war footing that we were heading towards, and all of that just lit this fire in me uh, with this this epiphany that that was what was that was what I was meant to do. That was the direction I wanted to head. Another thing that you say that stands out to me, and and you do it a lot. I I almost feel I don't think it's a contradiction in the book, but let's talk about like the triathlon. You said, I saw the writing on the wall. People were just better to me. And I feel like throughout the book and throughout your story, you've sold yourself short a lot of times. Would you agree with that? Look, I, I, no, I, I don't think I would. I, um, I do reflect on that triathlon period and I suspect my main failing there was was lack of, of grit, basically, and lack of mental resilience. I was a, a bit of a quitter. If things weren't going my way, I, I would, I would like there was times where I just was having a bad race and so instead of finishing it, I'd just stop and pack my kid up and, and walk home. My attitude just stunk. <laughs> And, you know, if it was going well, then that's easy. You, you know, you, you charge the finish line and you, you, here and there I'd, I'd win a race very carefully selected where the top pros weren't, weren't going to be racing. But, um, yeah, I think I, I, don't, I don't know, uh, I don't feel like I've sold myself short. I feel I've painted an accurate picture of where I was at at that moment. And, and I, I do reflect that the level that I was aspiring to was, was the elite level. And so I, I do reflect, I'm appreciative of the, the ability that I had at the time to even be in the mix, you know, to be even, even on the start line at a professional race. And, and so that was a good accomplishment. But at that stage, I was driven towards being on the podium as a professional. And so I, I did see my triathlon period as a failure and rightly or wrongly that was how i interpreted it at the time and i think fast forwarding to when i set my sights on sas selection a big part of that was to try and fill this void that uh, maybe i thought if i could train up to and get through that and and do that as a job that might fill some of the void that was left in me from this perceived failure in my triathlon aspirations and, and that's exactly what I'm talking about. So when you're in SAS selection, and the reason I say sell yourself short, not necessarily that you didn't know your own goals and stuff, but let's talk about for a minute in there, uh, just a piece out of it, a happy wanderer where you have to hit five peaks. You have to hit so far. You get four of the peaks. You say, I'm done. I'm not going to move at night. I'm, I'm this and that. You even go so far as to set up kind of your camp a little bit. You see another yeah. guy come by, say he's going to do it anyway. And then you're like, all right, fuck it. I'm not going to sit here and you go after and you accomplish it. That's what was really cool about your story to me all the way through the book was there's all these times where you go, nah, I don't know. And then you think about it for a second. And you're like, you know what? Fuck it. And that was the attitude every single time. And it always seemed to turn out okay once you just turned your brain off and said, fuck it, I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah, look, exactly right. And what, what I desperately was trying to achieve with that book, and I hope I did, was was just paint a, an honest picture of what happened, you know, the struggles, the ups and downs, the, the self-doubt and those moments of being, you know, right on the verge of being defeated. And, and that one that you talked to, I, to this day, I, you know, I credit that other 
soldier on the course, the other candidate that, that came charging past me, he was in the exact same position as I was where we were approaching dark, we'd been told don't move after dark. Uh, we had one more peak to get to the top of which the checkpoint was on top. And I had mentally, I was mentally defeated in that moment. I'm like, I'm not going to make it, you know, I'll just set up and see if I've done enough, you know. And there was, we, we had heard these rumours of you needed to get five peaks and, and a certain amount of kilometres. No one knew for sure. That's the nature of these courses, as you know, they, they keep it ambiguous and, and keep you guessing. But just the, the positivity of this guy's attitude was really uh, a powerful motivator for me. And yeah, I, I, I do reflect and wonder if I would have eventually got off my ass and tried to climb that peak anyway. But the fact that this guy charged past and I had such a, a shit attitude in that moment and he was so positive and I discussed it with him and he said, yeah, I hear you, man, but I ain't leaving any stone unturned. You know, they can, they can give me a, a buddy reprimand for moving after dark but what i'm what what he said was what i'm not going to do is not attempt this peak have myself fail the course and then forever wonder could i have and that was such a great attitude in the exact same circumstance i was in uh, he was overwhelmingly positive and optimistic and i and i was falling into that negativity and that self-defeatist uh, sort of mindset and so yeah that that was a, a good example and there's many in in my career where you hit those points where you think oh well i'm done for it on the verge of quitting but maybe if you just push a little bit further you know see what happens and and it's been surprising how many times i've been in that moment for whatever reason i've managed to just keep pushing a little bit further and, and that's enough to to move me forward and so on the flip of that coin when you very first get there and they give you these forms for drop on requests and you think you have this bright idea, I'll just eat my drop-on request. <laughs> yeah, look, I, 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 was, I was pretty mentally <laughs> invested in that process. I'd had a lot of time. So from that moment when I had that light bulb moment, end of 2001, I, you know, I'm going to be the doctor with the SAS. That became my life purpose. It, I, I had to finish my medical schooling. I had to do a couple of years as a junior doctor in a civilian hospitals. I had to do at least one year of military training courses to, to get my, my military qualifications up to speed. And, and so it ended up taking until 2008. So about seven years from when I set my sites on this goal to when I actually got the green light to attempt selection. And so over that period, I had really, uh, you know, reinforced this, this goal. I'd really, uh, I, I almost felt like I had evolved into that role and that selection was, was in a way just, just confirming it. It wasn't the actual selection. I'd already done that mentally. I'd sort of moved forward and selection was just a chance for, for my body to catch up, if you like. But I did know, and I, I had my, my doubts, like I guess anyone else in those sort of situations, that I might have a period of mental weakness. I knew that my, my mental resilience had, had let me down on occasions as a triathlete. And so I wanted to try to make sure that there was as many barriers as possible to me signing myself off that course. And so I knew that if I, if I ate that withdraw own request form, then I wouldn't have one for a start. And if I wanted to withdraw, I'd have to ask a DS for a new one and then maybe have to explain what happened to my original one. And the, that, the, the impossible thought of that conversation was going to serve as a barrier. So, yeah, that was the, that was the rationale. I, I didn't even want to have that thing. I couldn't get rid of it any other way. We were under the microscope, so I ate it. <laughs> I guess there's something in there that you can get from it. You ate chapstick <laughs> while you were there too. All right, oh, let's yeah. talk about the two different mind states you have, and they're very much apart from each other from the beginning of SAS training until the end, and then we could probably even take it forward into your combat era. When you start, every chance you get to get a leg up on someone, every chance or failure that you see from someone else is – a good mark in your book and you don't realize it until almost the very end of selection that it's about a team. It has nothing to do with you. So let's talk about your mind state going into it, how you came up with that. And what was that aha moment where you're like, Holy shit, this is not about me at all. And, and you really do come to that decision. And this is how I'll live the rest of my career. Yeah. So I, I had gone into selection with this, 
attitude that it was me versus the rest of the candidates. And when I reflect on how that came to be, it's, it, it's possibly because I had spent so long in individual sports where I'd be on the starting line and it was quite literally me versus everyone else around me. And you had to any opportunity to get a one up on the person next to you, you took it, you know, if you saw that they were lagging a little bit on the cycle leg of a triathlon, you'd, you'd put in a, a bit of a sprint to, to try and get ahead and, and then try and mentally break them. That was how you won races as an athlete in an individual sport. And, and so I guess that was probably why I, I started SAS selection with that same attitude. And it was the only one I knew. I'd been in these individual sports that were competitive, dog-eat-dog type environment for the, the prize money, for the, the sponsorships, for the, the opportunity to do that role professionally. And I, it took me quite some time to realise that, that that wasn't the right attitude. And indeed, that was a terrible attitude to have on SAS selection. And, and as you say, the first few days and I'd gone in with a, a healthy dose of self-doubt I'm, I'm a I'm a short bloke you know I'm, I'm not not quite six foot tall I was weighing 73 kilos at the start of SA selection I don't know what that is in pounds but it's small and you know so I felt intimidated at the start there was people that that were significantly bigger I knew there was people that were significantly more experienced from a military perspective that I was uh, in my mind competing against and in the early days that the massive attrition rate we started with about 160 people and they dropped like flies they they you know within five days or a week we'd halved that number and and i i used that initially as this this kind of fuel it's like you know great i'm i'm doing okay I, it was positively reinforcing the fact that that i was doing well but as the course evolved i started to realize that it's it's not an individual sport and it wasn't me versus the other candidates at all it was us as a group versus the course and it wasn't even us versus the ds you know and 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 i started to realize there wasn't this kind of you know podium there wasn't three spots in the unit available and we had to claw each other to get to those spots it was whoever was suitable they would they would take on for further training with the unit and and it really hit home in a humbling fashion towards the very end of the course I'd become quite sick. I'd got an infection in, I had a blister that got badly infected. I got an infection called cellulitis, an infection of the soft tissues of my leg that started to become a, a blood poisoning type situation. I was, by the end of it, I was uh, really crook and I literally couldn't shoulder the weight of what we needed to carry on the last day. And so I had these, these teammates of mine on the course, these other candidates, uh, dragging me up every time I collapsed, which I was doing all the time, taking my uh, part of the, the communal load and even helping me with my individual load towards the finish line. And it was a really humbling realisation that these people who, at the start of the course, I would have taken great delight in seeing them fail or withdraw, were now the ones that were actually skull dragging me to the end of this course. You know, that, that same attitude that I'd had, if they had have had it, they would have just left me in a heap on the side of this dirt road. And uh, so it was a, a really humbling moment for me and, and this sort of profound change in my mindset towards what is a productive mindset on selection but more so what is a productive mindset to be part of a high performance team if you can can you explain the emotions that you feel when you are down almost out and a teammate comes by picks you up and takes you because like you said your whole life had been individual sports individual you against the system how does that feel when you see a teammate who has no reason other than he's a teammate to pick you up and carry you on? What's going on inside you when you see it? Certainly very humbling. Uh, very, uh, it's a very, for me, that was a very vulnerable sort of space. It was the, probably the first time really where I was at a point where my body was just outright failing me. It, it was my body would not do what my mind was trying to tell it to do. And that loss of this sensation of control for a, a young, fit guy was really, really humbling and uh, really confronting, to be honest. And then this uh, just this overwhelming sense of gratitude to someone who I knew was suffering as much as I was, 
but to to use additional energy to, to drag me off the deck and and move me forward for no reason you know there was no benefit to them to drag me to the end of this course and so yeah certainly very uh, vulnerable feeling very uh, humbling feeling but amazing feeling of gratitude towards these this selfless act from these mates of, of mine or came to be mates of mine these other candidates on the course to expend additional energy at their own you know, potential detriment to, to drag me to the finish where it doesn't benefit them at all. So, you know, that was a, a really impactful moment for me. It, it knocked me down a, a, a number of pegs from a an ego level, but I think to a to my benefit in the long term, it, it made me see this whole thing through a very different lens and the power of doing those those selfless acts for someone else, just how much that can mean to someone else in their moment of need. And and that's what, what I was going to ask you next was, do you think it made you, I don't know if you'd say a better doctor, but do you think it made you more of an empathetic doctor maybe, or more of a sympathetic doctor to what people were feeling and how bad they really were out in the field? Yeah, I think it was one of many experiences over my military career that that improved my attitude towards patients as a doctor in that relationship. I think as I, I went through my career, the the opportunity to be able to use my medical skill set in these developing countries, in these war zones, to be able to make a, a really significant difference to, to the health of, and I'm not specifically talking about the the, the gunshot wounds or the blast injury, you know, that, that was a part of the role, but I'm talking about the, the hearts and minds type things, the, the opportunity to do small but very significant interventions in places like regional Afghanistan or Papua New Guinea or Timor-Leste, these countries that don't have access to good medical care and that quite literally you can make a, 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 an intervention that, that saves a life with something pretty simple and pretty cheap. Uh, in these places, and so that definitely had changed me in the in the direction of being far more empathetic, being far more grateful for this incredible you know education that I was able to get, this skill set I was able to get, and these opportunities that I could have to to help there. And and I've done my best to try and keep that going through my medical practice since. Really looking at it through the lens of gratitude appreciating that I'm in this amazing role that allows me to help other people when they're having, you know, sometimes their, their worst day in an emergency department or an ER. Let's talk about another piece of your family. And I want to talk about your wife for a minute. Now, you knew her before you went to SAS training. She was actually a person that, that kicked you at one point into to still training, you know, what you kind of thought when you got married, how you thought in your head, and maybe you didn't, because I don't think a lot of us do when we get married, how you were going to balance this life of military special operations, having a wife, having a family, because they're two completely different worlds. I don't care what anyone says. It's just like law enforcement and having a family. It's two worlds, and you really don't want those two worlds colliding. So let's talk about how you thought about it in the beginning, how you thought it was going to go, and how it changed over time. Yeah, look, it's it's no different at all to you know law enforcement or any other first responder organisation or indeed any other high stress, high pressure role. You've you know work and and personal life and and we've got a, a bit of a, a joke in the army. Maybe they have it back home, but it's that if the army wanted you to have a wife, they would have issued you with one. I'm, I'm sure it's universal and and it's you know it's funny, but but I think it does talk to the underlying truth that those lifestyles are really conflicting and particularly the the highly invested roles within military or policing. I mean, they're all highly invested, but the, I guess the more deployed roles or the more away you are or the more that work demands of you, the more pressure it puts on that relationship on the home front. And in a way, I, I had the benefit of knowing the direction that I wanted to head and having at least some theoretical awareness of what that meant lifestyle wise many years before I actually did the role. I, I was getting these glimpses into it through my brother. And so I met my wife in 2002 and we were together. We were married in 2006. So a couple of years before 
I did SAS selection and started to, to deploy with the special operations. And in that period where I was sort of building that relationship with my wife and leading up to our, our marriage, I was pretty stable in terms of my role. I was either a medical student or a junior doctor in civilian hospitals, which was a busy lifestyle, but a fairly predictable one. And so we, we'd had a lot of opportunity to talk about and, and she was very clear the direction I wanted to take. I was, and b before we got engaged, we had a very frank discussion about what this thing might look like if I did reach this uh, ambition of, of becoming a member of special operations, you know, deploying a lot, the, the experiences I might have that she might have, uh, what family having kids might look like superimposed on that. And so we went in as best you can with our eyes wide open. But I, I think this is a lot like someone trying to describe to a non-parent what it's like to have a kid. You can understand in theory, or maybe trying to describe to a woman what it's like to give birth, you know, and of course I've never done that, but you, you can understand these things in theory and imagine how it might be, but you can never truly appreciate on any sort of visceral level just how it's gonna be. So by the time we hit that point where I was away a whole bunch and we had young kids we were in the thick of it we were committed and it's kind of like a roller coaster ride i guess that the roller coaster is taken off and you just got to ride that thing till it stops because the way i read it in the book and once again correct me if i'm wrong it i think once the special operations career actually started i think it still kind of took you guys kind of from the side it, it wasn't necessarily a bad thing, but I think that there was a lot more involved than maybe even you thought. And that's why I asked before you did it, what your thoughts were. Is is that kind of correct in saying that? That's the way I felt you wrote it. Yeah, I think so, exactly. And I think that comes back to, once again, me looking forward to what I thought that career would be and then the reality of that career. And, of course, when you're, you're looking forward to these things, you, you tend to only see the positives. If you were focused on the negatives, you probably wouldn't pursue it, of course. But you, you just see the shiny stuff, the, the professional satisfaction, professional growth, the opportunity to test yourself to be part of a high-performance team, the, I guess to some degree the prestige of being with one of these units, the you know all that, that stuff that was motivated me to want to join special operations. And when, when I was actually in it, I think a degree of the, uh, you know, I, I felt all of that and when, particularly when I was new to the role and, and I realised this dream that I'd had for six, seven odd years was, was finally coming to fruition and that I would be pretty quickly going to Afghanistan with the, the Special Operations Task Group. It, it was all falling into place. And so for me professionally, the, it was all taking off, but that, that was dragging me away from this personal relationship. And, and I, I do reflect some, once again, somewhat, uh, you know, shamefully on, I was very career focused. I was very, uh, you know, oriented towards that goal. And once, once I'd got into that life, I, I embraced it wholeheartedly, but that did come at the cost of, of me being away a lot. You know, I did selection just before our first son turned one. And I'd, so I'd, I'd just gotten back home in time and the only reason I'd come home, well, there was a couple of reasons, but one was I, I needed surgery on my leg to, to drain pus out of it and cut some infected pieces out. And so I just managed to get out of hospital after eight days in hospital following this surgery to be at my son's first birthday. And so I, I kind of reflect on this period. I mean, I was there and all this stuff was happening, but I was mentally really not there. I was just thinking about how quick can I get better? How, how quickly can I get back to my military role? And so it, it did take me away from a lot of that. It caused me to miss a lot of the, the magic of, of having young kids, that, that initial parenting. I didn't get that because I wasn't there to experience it. And I was preoccupied with this other amazing sort of thing in my life. So let's talk about as you go into uh, combat for your first time. I think we need to set the basis. You're not just a medic. You're a doctor. And everyone knows about the Hippocratic Oath and do no harm. And this is where your story gets very, very good to me. Because the whole time I'm reading it, I'm trying to balance it in my head. Do no harm. And there were points in your career where... You didn't care if you did harm, if you killed an enemy combatant. 
I've got to understand from you directly, not just the book. How do you balance that in your brain? How do you make that work? Because those two things seem the exact opposites of each other. It's yeah, it's a question that comes up a lot. And, and I get why people are interested in that. It does seem like a massive paradox, this idea that I've gone and trained as a doctor and the whole do no harm, Hippocratic Oath, all, all the rest of it, and then gone and, and joined this unit who on a war front footing, you know, their primary mission set was kill capture for a long period of time there. And so there's that real paradox. And I think this, this discussion breaks into two parts. There's the legal part of it, which is bound by rules of engagement, laws of armed conflict, Geneva Convention, that sort of stuff. And so as a military member out there in that, that battlefield space, then the use of force is bound by all of that. And in the situations where I did use force, I was, I was very much uh, in alignment with our rules of engagement. I mean, I was I was having lethal force used against me and that entitled me, doctor or not, to use lethal force against the enemy. So, I mean, there's, there's that part of it, the emotionless kind of was this legal type thing. The, the other aspect of that discussion, which, which goes back and forth, but is that, well, for a start, you know, the, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda weren't signatories to the Geneva Convention. So the Geneva Convention became a bit of a moot point. Of course, we still abided by it, but we never wore any any medical insignia that would, would designate us as medical assets in special operations. We were what, what was called an undeclared medical asset. So to the, the enemy, they couldn't tell us from anyone else. So we weren't trying to get any benefit of the Geneva Convention by being a declared medical asset, even though that, you know, I, I suspect that would have got you targeted first, I, to be I honest. I absolutely but, agree. <laughs> So I mean, there's that whole there's that whole legal perspective, which is which is very easily covered by the fact that when I was firing my rifle, it was because I was being shot at, you know, or mates of mine were being shot at, or critical equipment or infrastructure was being shot at, our extraction helicopters or whatever else, and so that that justifies it legally. The ethical piece, I think, is a, is a, a more interesting discussion, and to be honest with you, I never really even well i certainly didn't have any ethical dilemma with using uh, you know lethal force and I, I didn't really even question it in my mind my role and my skill set was required to be as close as possible to point of injury to try and save one of my teammates when it distilled down to it that was at the crux of what i was there to do i had this specialist skill set as many other specialists in uh you know tar targeting elements had and unless i was close enough to to use it it was pointless so by default i had to be close enough to the pointy end to be able to get to a bloke who'd been hit within minutes to try and you know save their life if they were bleeding arterially or had airway problems or the stuff that that is a preventable cause of death on the battlefield you've got minutes in the the worst case and if i wasn't close enough then i couldn't do my job so to be close enough it by default meant i was going to end up in the gunfight so that that was the the justification of like ethically, I needed to be there. That meant I ended up doing a bit of gunfighting. It also meant I could get to mates of mine when they were in need. But the other side of that ethical discussion is that, that there were times when I actually treated the enemy as well. And so, you know, we could quite literally have just had a gunfight and incapacitated some, some enemy, but, but they're not dead. And I'd treat them. And once again, ethically, I've, I've had people ask, how could you possibly do that? You know, this is an enemy fighter who was just trying to kill you and your mates minutes before, and you are saving their life. How does that work? And I, I can honestly say in those moments, I, I never had any ethical, well, well, thoughts at all. It was just like, here's a, a combat casualty. I'll, I'll treat them. Let's, let's, I've got this skill set. Let's treat them. So, I mean, you know, the ethics of, of using force, I think, get balanced against that the ethics of, well, hey, I can use my medical skill set to actually treat the enemy as well and, and did on uh, several occasions. So what kind of guy can you describe you? What kind of soldier and what kind of doctor are you the first time you deploy into Afghanistan? I think naive is probably the best word to sum that up. I was the, I think, typical 
young man, bulletproof, you know, in my mind, bulletproof young man going to war for the first time, only seeing the excitement of it, only seeing this as, as a, a big adventure with, uh, once again, like the, we spoke about before in terms of what the role might look like, this theoretical knowledge that I might get killed or that my mates might get killed, but no, no visceral ability to feel what that's like. No, no idea how to really understand that on a, a true visceral empathetic level. And so I went off on my first tour of Afghanistan. I'd done a trip before that with the regular army to, to East Timor, as it was called by that time. Oh, sorry, Timor-Leste, I should say. And But it was a peacekeeping mission. It was a, a sort of low tempo Great experience, but not nothing like the Afghanistan experience. And so I was looking forward to this as an adventure, as a, a chance to test my skills, as a, an opportunity I naively wanted to get in gunfights and, and see what that was like, see how I'd go. You know, I think some of that void that was left in me from not reaching the, the pinnacle of triathlon, this was, was like an opportunity to go and, and do this thing for real. And... Interestingly, the, as it played out, that first tour that I did of Afghanistan, we didn't actually have anyone killed. Our task group, every, every person that left came back with us, which when you look at the, the averages was quite rare for a special operations task group uh, from Australia to, to not have any casualties and not really even any significant injuries. There was a couple of guys shot, a couple of other guys injured here and there, but they were, they were trivial. And I think that just further reinforced this this illusion of invulnerability this you know we're bulletproof we're special operations this is all fun i've got some great experience in uh, treating combat casualties you know the local national partner forces these these sort of people but it was never my own blokes that i was treating so i came away from that tour just falsely reinforcing this sense of invulnerability, this sense of, of, you know, this is a bunch of fun. I want more of this. This is great. You know, how can I expand on this? I, I just wanted to get back and, and get more of everything. When you get back, we, we talked about you being a soldier and a doctor. When you come back from that first deployment, you a different husband, a different father? It had, I, with hindsight, I was, I was wound pretty tight. I was, I was quite, uh, hypervigilant. I was everything you'd expect someone to be after a military deployment or after a you know a, a decent period of time as a as a frontline police officer, ambulance officer. That natural upregulation of your stress response system, and then having spent that protracted time in that that high threat environment, I was hypervigilant. I was a little bit angrier than I, than I had been. I was sort of making sense of a few things that had, had happened on that tour, but um, you know, none of that was these big critical incidents that that took that that came later and, and took years and years to process. But the overwhelming sensation was this unsettled feeling back home that something had changed. I'd had a, a taste of this thing, and I was trying to work out. If I loved it, part of me did. Part of me probably registered that it was, you know, there was risk there, but maybe that comes back to that underlying sensation-seeking personality type. But once the dust settled on that period, I uh, realised now that, that I probably became a bit more disconnected from my, my family. Uh, I'd had these exposures and experiences that were very outside the realm of, of what my wife and, and other people around me had had. And, and I felt a, a little bit of maybe isolation from them, which, uh, which was, was strengthening my bond with this tribe, you know, these other soldiers that I'd experienced it with. And so there was this sort of drift starting to really happen from me and and broader society which was was bonding me to that military tribe but the underlying urge was to get back overseas to go and do it again and to do more of it and that's where i was headed with this with law enforcement you find out or first responders and things like that you find out that you can't talk to certain people about it because they don't understand what you went through is that something that you ran into and you think that that was part of the thing that helped create the distance yeah, definitely. And, and I think the 
I think that is a real divide, in my opinion, that occurs between military and first responder groups and the broader community is just those unique experiences that that you cannot possibly convey to others. And I'm not trying to suggest that they're they're better or they're bigger or they're, you know, everyone has stress in their life for the same reason that my wife can't appreciate what I've experienced. I can't appreciate what she's experienced because, you know, I haven't lived some of her experiences. And so it's not better or worse or bigger or smaller. It's just different, but it does create a divide. And, and that inability to be able to convey how something is affecting you because someone else doesn't have the same experience to be able to viscerally empathize does create a distance and I, I think certainly fast forward to when I transitioned out of the military it created this intense loneliness I was surrounded by people but I didn't get them they didn't get me I, I didn't feel that I could share my experiences the times when I tried I could see they didn't understand it so it, it, it kind of almost felt like it was trivializing or minimizing or somehow diminishing my experience and and so that that drove this real sense of isolation in that period of time but i think it probably was starting to happen uh, as i started to get more and more indoctrinated into the military that divide started well and that's something that you say is when you come into the military that you are very much integrated into thinking that i think how you said it was civilians are inferior to military is that <laughs> pretty much the look yeah and and i you know I, I can see how ignorant and stupid that mentality is but it's it's bound by this this what the psychologists call social identity theory and it's our tendency to form groups and if we're a member of a group then that is one of our in groups and then by virtue of that people who aren't in that group are out groups and and you start to organize your social identity by these groups that you're a member of and so when i became a part of the the army I was all of a sudden part of this army in group and that by definition makes civilians an out group and then it's a, a, a kind of it is ignorant it's deeply ignorant but i think that the tendency for in groups is to default to putting down the out group they see themselves in it and it strengthens your own in group identity it, it sort of helps with in group cohesion it helps with esprit de corps within you know certain organizations certain units but you see yourself as just a little bit better than the out group and yeah i, I definitely uh, with hindsight i saw that uh, evolving with regard to civilians. I saw the military as being, in my mind at that time, superior to civilians, which is a very toxic mindset to have. Okay, but when you say ignorant, is that the right word? Because I almost think of it as when you think like that or when you set yourself up like that, it's almost a form of self-preservation. And it's a preservation of the group because let's all agree you're an outcast to them too. That's just the way it is. Very much so. You talk about them being an outlier. Military, law enforcement, first responders are an outlier to those people. And so I don't know if it, I would use the word of ignorance. I would say it's almost a form of self-preservation because if you're not going to do it, who is going to do it? And the reason I asked that question to you is because did you run across anybody that didn't understand why you did the job you did. Now, we've talked about a lot of people had questions, how can you be a doctor and do this? But was there anyone that you talked to? And once again, I hate to beat a dead horse. I'm talking from a law enforcement perspective, but I look at it when people go, well, I don't understand why you guys do this. And I don't understand. Well, you're not going to ever understand unless you do it. There's no amount of explaining I could do. Did you run into that problem? Oh, yeah, for sure. And, and you, I mean, you're spot on and maybe ignorant isn't the right term there, but, but I'm under no illusion that, that you know, members of, of what I perceived to be the out group, for them, they're within their own in group and they have these derogatory kind of impressions of, of what is an out group to them. And that might be military or law enforcement. And, and you see this, of course, and it's the way we do this. We stereotype and, and we tend to put down the out group, uh, maybe as a form of self-preservation, as you say, but certainly to to bolster our own identity and our own in-group identity. And, and yeah, definitely as I went along, there was, and, and got more and more invested in that identity, there was a number of, of people in my personal life that, 
that clearly couldn't understand what I was doing. And, and probably the overwhelming response that I got a lot was, was that, oh, you know, poor you, that must have been terrible with regards to deploying to Afghanistan and this sort of thing. And that was really difficult because I, inside, I'm like, this was the best thing that's ever happened to me. You know, this was the most exciting, the, this most intense experience of my life and and where I've really felt alive and it was I knew that it was when someone's coming at it from the mindset of oh that must be be terrible you know thank you for your service and sacrifice all that stuff comes from a good place I know that but there's no way you're going to get from that point if that's someone's mindset about what military service looks like through to getting them to understand that this thing is awesome and this was my you know, primary focus of my life for, for years and years was to get back to that war zone to do it all again. And so it's, I think that drove more of that distancing. And I realize the, it drives you more, more and more towards your in-group because they understand you. You don't have to have those difficult conversations. You don't get those contrary opinions of what you're doing. And, and that, that can lead to, you know, group think and some of the negative aspects of that for sure. But it definitely divides the uh, in the military context i think a lot of civilians from the military it can i think definitely cause distancing in in uh, relationships uh, and i saw that myself with people that I, I knew before my military life those relationships sort of faded away and sometimes it was uh, underpinned by that complete failure to understand that this was a good thing for me and and even that kind of sympathy which came from a good place but that sympathy of oh you know your poor thing that, that must have been terrible which was the exact opposite of what i was feeling i also think that it brings a lot of isolation too you you talk about the group but when you're not around the group a lot of guys a lot of girls go into an isolation period too where they just don't want anything to do with anybody because they get tired of explaining or they get tired of of talking about it. And that seems to be the only thing. Now we've talked a, a lot about your first deployment and that there wasn't, it kind of bolstered that in, in vulnerability, uh, that you were kind of bulletproof. When in these deployments did bad things start happening to where you went, Oh shit, maybe it's not the way I thought it was. Yeah, that was my second special operations tour of Afghanistan. So that was 2011, uh, very early in the year I deployed again. So my first one was mid-2009 till late 2009. 2010, I didn't deploy. I was I was um, sort of at, at a unit in Sydney, a second commando regiment, another one of our special operations units, and and I, I had to stay back, which was, which was good. It gave me some stability on the home front and and I had to kind of run the, the medical center for the unit for that year, which was a good experience at the time, but I was just itching to get back over. And so start of 2011, I'd gone to, to across to, to SASR again, so I posted over there, left pretty early in that year. And that was, the, the dynamic had changed for us in Afghanistan. It was becoming far more kinetic for us. We had far more air support, so my first tour, did a lot of vehicle mounted patrols, which limited our numbers of, of targets that we could reach out and touch. And, and so 2011 was a different beast. We, we had a lot more air support and we'd also had, uh, we were attached with a DEA, a fast element, so Drug Enforcement Administration. So we'd started to do this combined counter narcotic, counter uh, kind of leadership operations, and which opened up another avenue to, to going out and, and doing these kinetic targeting operations. And, and so that was when I, I, it first occurred to me that, that hey, hang on, we're, we're playing for keeps. And, and I can tell you the exact moment that that happened. It was the, the 23rd of May, 2011, about uh, 3 p.m. in the afternoon, Afghanistan time. And, and that was the first time that I responded to a mate of mine uh, that I, I couldn't save. And that was a, a bit of a, a sledgehammer moment, to be honest. That was the, the veneer of special operations really rapidly stripping away and, and revealing what this thing is actually all about. Can we talk about that? Can you talk about yeah. the story and uh, just kind of, because of course we know how it affected you, but I, I really want to know 
because you said it was at that moment. So it has to be a very defining moment for someone to say, I knew it was exactly yeah. at this time. So can we kind of walk through the story? And, and if there's anything that pops up, I'll kind of ask as you're going. Yeah, no, for sure. And I do talk to this in in uh, the Combat Doctor in the book. Uh, and I have, you know, that, that was passed through the families. And there was two others in, in pretty quick succession after this on that same tour. And, and so it was the cumulative effect of those three and that rotation that uh, plus a, a bunch of other exposures on that rotation that really uh, was was pivotal that whole period but that moment so we we had gone into a target in southern Afghanistan it was a, a, a Taliban stronghold village and uh, as I understood it if I'm remembering correctly it was part of a bigger plan to try and and just degrade the enemy to soften it up to allow the US, uh, I think it was Marines, were going to try and sweep through and take this village back. But it was basically an enemy held village where they were uh, strongholded. And so we knew it was going to be pretty much a, a, a gunfight from the second we hit the ground. And so we inserted in the middle of the night, we'd planned to be on target for 48 hours. And so we'd sort of planned accordingly and, and went in with what we thought would be enough ammunition. We ended up needing an ammunition resupply after the first day of fighting because it was a, a little more intensive than we anticipated. But the, the 160th, actually, uh, you, your uh, group of, of magic aviators dumped us in there middle of the night. And, and as, as listeners will know, they don't muck around. So they sort of put us in uh, really quickly inserted us a few hundred meters out from this village and, and within seconds of the, the helicopters dumping us in there there was machine gun fire rpg fire pouring into our insertion spot and so we we raced to the edge of this village and there was sort of gunfights going on sporadically throughout the village as we as we got into our predetermined compounds of interest and so we, we didn't take any casualties that night we established ourselves. There was a bit of a lull over that first period of darkness between about midnight and, and just before dawn. And so most of us grabbed an hour of sleep or two hours sleep in between pickets. And, and then sun up the following day, it was just on. We, we were every element that we had in the village was engaged the, the whole day. And the, and the gunfighting intensified. It, it crescendoed into the evening. And middle of summer in Afghanistan, you know, it was it was hot, 45 odd degrees Celsius. I don't know what that looks like Fahrenheit, but but hot, hot, very dry. <laughs> I, I'm just going to tell you, I know none of your measurements. <laughs> nah, sorry, mate. I, I, yeah, I should work this out, but but stinking hot. I saw it in the dry. book and I thought, wow, that seems pretty cold. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> But we, so we'd gone through that first day and we, we had predators overhead, Apaches, you know, fast jets, we, you name it. We, we were in a proper good old gunfight and hadn't taken any casualties that day. So it was sort of, everything was going well. Um, we, overnight, we, we were starting to run low on ammo. So we got this ammo and water resupply. Once again, bit of a lull period of darkness. And, and then the next day... Dan, can I stop the, you for just a yeah, second? Please. I, I think you yeah. need to explain that resupply because it did not go as oh. planned. <laughs> no, it did not. So we we had a, uh, a Hercules, so C-130, uh, which... The, the rumor had it that they could they could drop these pallets in and these things, you know, they'd come in low and slow and and drop these pallets and everything would be perfectly intact and, and you know, everything it would be roses. And, and so it sounded great in theory. In practice, this thing came in and, and I mean, to the, the pilot and the crew's credit, they were flying this machine almost impossibly slow. I, I'd gotten up onto the roof to watch this. It was pitch black. Uh, everyone was on night vision and, and this blacked out aircraft comes in and it just seemed to be going too slow to be even in the sky. You know, they'd slowed this thing down. I don't know about when an aircraft stalls, but it just seemed, you know, improbable. And it was just skimming over the, the rooftops of this village. So it was a very impressive piece of flying. But for whatever reason, the pallets didn't get kicked out where we wanted them to, which we'd identified this field of crops that was pretty well protected, pretty accessible, where we could go and get the, the pallets from. We'd asked to have the drop in two parts. First part, water. 
second part ammo. So the thought there being that the first part, if, if it went wrong, didn't really matter. You know, we could do without water for another day of, of what we were doing. But we didn't want the ammo getting dropped in the wrong spot. You know, we don't want to drop pallets of bloody high explosive rockets and 40 mil and whatever else for the enemy to get, of course. But the, as it turned out, plane comes in, doesn't dump these pallets or this water in, in the predetermined spot flies past and then starts to gain altitude and for whatever reason that was the point where they kicked out everything so they I don't know what happened and I certainly don't want to criticize the pilots or crew you know that's it was a very impressive piece of flying but the the end result was a whole bunch of ammo and a whole bunch of water just strewn over hundreds of meters in open space immediately in front of a Taliban machine gun position that had been lighting us up all day and so it was this um this very uh, delicate recovery operation. We had to get this stuff, but we, we were out there walking out in the open, just knowing that at any second, if the, that enemy sort of woke up, they'd just arc up and cut us to shreds. But thankfully, that wasn't the case. Uh, and we recovered all the ammo and, and water and, and resupplied throughout that night. The other point of, of significance to this story was that the bloke who actually led that resupply was a, a highly decorated uh, Australian special operations guy, commando called Brett Wood. And so as, as fate would have it, he was the, the guy we lost the next afternoon. And, and so Brett sort of, you know, gripped this up situation that had gone wrong. And, and as, as was the nature of the bloke, he's like, well, yeah, this has gone to shit. Here's what we're going to do to solve the problem and just got it done. You know, so everyone got resupplied. Sun up the next morning, the, the enemy had reinforced overnight. And so it was go time that that to that point in my career, that was by far the most intensive combat I've ever experienced. It was it was nonstop throughout that day, and and we started to to take casualties that day. There was a couple of blokes that got hit by grenade shrapnel. They'd been trying to clear an enemy compound series and had a grenade chucked at them, and uh, so that detonated. And thankfully, they weren't too badly off. I, I, I went across and had a look at them and, and sort of did what needed to be done and we evacuated them. Had a guy hit by a, a rocket fragment, massive chunk taken out of his leg. So same story, tidied him up a bit and medically evacuated him. And these, these medical evacuations were starting to get a bit hairy. They were under heavy enemy fire. The you know, a couple of Apaches would have to come in and try and, and suppress the enemy. Then the bird would scream in, we'd dump our casualties on, it'd, it'd go out. So some pretty impressive flying being done by those um, Apache and, and AME pilots. And then as the afternoon progressed, a, a four-man team from our group was trying to clear this enemy compound series, which had a, a, a several machine gun positions that had been giving us a bit of grief. And it was at that stage that that team, the lead member, this bloke who'd done the resupply the night before, Brett Wood, uh, struck a, a large improvised explosive device. And, and so him and all the other three team members were, were injured in varying degrees by that blast, uh, Brett really sort of catastrophically. And I was part of a, a quick reaction force. So, so I raced across to where our company headquarters was grouped up with a, with a, a, a group led by a, another highly decorated commando bloke by the name of Todd Langley, who sadly would be a, another bloke I'd find myself responding to, who, who there was nothing we could do for, and we lost him sometime later on that same tour. But he led us to this incident site, and, and that was where I, I first found myself responding to a critically wounded teammate of mine. And so that, that was a game changer. That day was, was pivotal. It changed how you acted as a doctor and as a leader, too, would you say? I think you became a lot more harsh after that happened. Yeah, no question. And this is probably a bit of a regret from my, my time as a military leader. I, With hindsight, I suspect, and, and, you know, there was that incident, then we, about a month later, we lost, an, or less than, on the, um, on the 6th of June, uh, responded to another teammate, couldn't save him. Fourth of July was when we lost uh, Todd, the bloke who'd led the quick reaction force to, to Brett. So there was these three incidents in pretty quick succession 
where we, we lost guys and, and interspersed among that, we were having other guys shot and blown up, both our guys and also our partner force, the Afghans. And, and in the background of all of this was this, this, when we weren't out on missions with the task group, we were working at the Ford surgical teams. So you, you never had a day off. You were always, and, and this was by our own choice, you know, you were always there trying to, to deal with combat casualties, be it at the Ford surgical teams or on the aeromedical evacuation helicopter, the dust off birds, we were lucky enough to launch on them and, and do missions. So it was hugely stimulating and rewarding, but with hindsight, you know, this, this trauma load was just endless and punctuated by these critical incidents, losing teammates and being the, the guy on the ground trying to sort of save them. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it initially drove me to train not only myself, but my medics uh, almost to this manic level. I was just so motivated to, uh, I think probably part of it was to stay occupied so that I didn't have time to sit around and think about stuff. I just wanted to occupy myself every spare moment. But also I think it came from a good place. I like to believe that I wanted my medics to be so well trained and myself so that if we responded and we lost a, a guy, then we could put our hand on our hearts and say, hey, this wasn't because I wasn't trained well enough. You know, that we, we it was because the injuries just beat us on the day. There was no saving them. But that with hindsight and probably my, my heightened emotional state at the time, it did lead me to, to act what I now consider regrettably towards some of my medics. I was very harsh on them. There was no uh, sugar coating my feedback uh, to them in the training environment. If, if they fell short of this almost impossibly high standard that I was setting, I was, was uh, I really ripped them. And so I think it came from a good place. I think it was driven by these critical incidents. But when I reflect on my behavior then, it, I think it's regrettable. I think I, I uh, was disrespectful to these medics with the way I treated them in that period. All right, let's compare that doctor after that happens to you and how you train your medics and the doctor that had the Gerber incident happen on a helicopter. <laughs> well, that was on the same tour. So that was, um, yeah, that was 2011 once again. Uh, so that was on a, a medical evacuation uh, mission. We'd launched to pick up a, a partner force guy. And actually, I think the probably the in my opinion, the, the, the better part of that Gerber incident story was the decision to launch. We'd, we'd been called for this Category A gunshot wound. We raced out to the, the helicopter, the Black Hawk, uh, spun it up so the pilots got this thing going in, in no time. We were ready to get airborne. And our chase bird, the, the other Black Hawk, which was a bit of a gunship, a bit of a support aircraft, just had a malfunction. It didn't, it didn't spin up. And so we're stuck there turning and burning on the on the um, airstrip and we're getting feedback from the field that an American crew had stabilized this soldier he'd been shot a few times uh, through the neck and chest but he was in pretty bad shape he was hanging by a thread had had his blood pressure was critically low this this you know this guy was clearly bleeding internally and uh, was dying quickly he needed surgery and so we, we got the radio transmission through that an Apache was going to escort us but it was 15 minutes away. And the, the pilot kind of, he came up on the internal comms of the helicopter and, and, and said to, you know, myself and the flight medic, there was a, a US flight medic in the bird and, and I was riding along and, and sort of said, hey, has this guy got 15 minutes? It was about a 10 minute time of flight away to the casualties. So in effect, you know, we were going to be delayed about 25 minutes to this guy. And, and our consensus was, nah, this, this bloke is, will probably be dead by the time we get there if we wait for the Apache. And, and so this, this pilot, he, um, he launched without authority. He just said, you know, fuck it, I'm going. It's, and it's one of these, I think, awesome ethical case studies in morals. And where do you stand? Like, do you, do you play by the rules and do things right from a, an organizational perspective? Or do you bend the rules, or in this case, break the rules to do what is ethically and morally right for you? Uh, as an individual. And in that instance, you know, in that split second that this pilot had to decide, he made the decision we're going. And, you know, of course, in effect, he risked the aircraft, he risked the, the crew without having this 
support aircraft, but he made that decision that the casualty had been extracted to a US base, so it was relatively safe in, in the broader context. We weren't picking him up from the middle of a gunfight in the mountains. But yeah, he launched and we went and got this guy. And then on the, the way back, he, he was in bad shape. He was in and out of consciousness. He was in my, uh, from my assessment, was, was dying on us then and there. And, and I had thought he was suffering from a buildup of pressure in the chest, a thing called a tension pneumothorax. So air leaking into his chest and, and building up pressure, squashing his heart and, and his, his good lung. So he had a punctured lung where he'd been shot. And I realized that what I needed to do at, in that moment was to make a hole in the side of this guy's chest, to a decent sized hole. We'd stuck cannulas in there, little needles to try and relieve the pressure. That worked initially for a little bit, but then they blocked off. And, and so I needed to make a decent hole and, and I didn't have the right kit to, to do it. And in, in that moment, assessed this bloke. I thought he was dying right there in front of me, in front of the, in the, in the back of the helicopter there. So I, I used a, a boot knife, a Gerber boot knife that I just had on my rig, just a sort of utility knife to, to make a hole in the side of this guy's chest. And, and thankfully the diagnosis was right. It relieved that pressure and we were, we were able to stabilize that guy enough to get him to surgery to save his life. But uh, the, the fallout of that incident was was quite significant both for the pilot and myself uh, when it came to light that I'd, I'd used this boot knife to, to do a surgical procedure. And, and I guess understandably, if you look at that objectively, it's a, it's a pretty cowboy thing to do. And, and some of the context of me doing it got lost in the investigations and, and they all ended up okay. But it was a, certainly a, a really dynamic night. It was a great night in with with hindsight looking at these ethical decisions that need to be made in very short periods of time with life or death consequences that then get retrospectively judged by those who weren't there who may not have the the context and have the benefit of analyzing it over the days to weeks and, and i'm sure you you have this in policing all the time and it, it's a, a frustrating space to find yourself well and, and the Part of it that, that I ask comparing those two guys together was because, as you mentioned, it, it was almost a cowboy thing to do. It wasn't protocol. As a matter of fact, you and the medic had decided at one point not to do it. Then you decided that you were going to do it. Yeah. But the thing that got you caught was kind of being a cowboy in front of the surgeons at the hospital when you actually got him there. That's what got everything kicked up. And so that's yep. why I ask, once you get harsh on these guys and about being experts all the time, being professional all the time, how do those two guys compare? Because that was a very, I'm not saying it wasn't cool because it was a really cool moment, <laughs> but it was a very cowboy moment to do. And if you looked at a medic or another doctor, would you feel the yep. same way about it? Yeah, look, I, I would. And, and this is where there was some inconsistencies there and... I, that is a, another one of my deep regrets from my military time is not doing that procedure. That is, I, I will go to my grave being absolutely convinced that was the right thing to do at that point. And I, I'm, I'm glad I acted, you know, by the letter of the law, the rules that bound us, the right thing for me to do was just let that bloke die. And I don't think anyone would have questioned that. They would have said, hey, you know what, nothing you could do. He was all shot up. He was leaking internally and whatever else. But I did act. And and to this day, and as I said, I think for the rest of my days, I'm proud of the fact that I was able to, that I, I saw what needed to be done. I didn't have the right kit. I improvised and, and did it. The thing that I'm ashamed of in that situation is, is came, as you say, when we were at the forward surgical team and the guy was getting resuscitated and I felt this need to tell the surgeon what I'd done and I would sort of did it in an indirect fashion. I was trying to, to remind them that the bloke needed a bunch of antibiotics, which was stupid. I mean, they're, they're surgeons for crying out loud. They know this game inside out. They, they would have given him the antibugs anyway. But embarrassingly, I think in that moment, and I was pretty jacked up on adrenaline. It was a, a pretty high octane sort of experience. It was 
overwhelmingly positive experience for me to have had this guy, uh, you know, on the verge of death and then do this intervention. And then he did actually arrest. His heart stopped beating and we'd started some CPR. So he had sort of really tried hard to die. And despite that, we, we got him back. And so I was, I was buzzing. I was high as a kite on adrenaline. And in that moment, I felt the need to, to let someone know what I'd done. I think, that, I mean, this was pure ego. This was me thinking, you know, this is the coolest thing that I've ever done in my life and I want someone else to, to know this. And, and it fell dead flat. It was received exactly as you would hope it would be received <laughs> by, the, by the surgeon. He just looked at me like the piece of shit that I was in that moment and just sort of, you know, shook his head. And, and I think, to your point, if one of the medics under my command had have behaved in that fashion, I would have torn strips off them. I would have torn strips off them, yet there I was doing exactly that. So, yeah, that was that was regrettable, uh, you know, ashamed of that action after the fact. It was definitely the catalyst that got me in, investigated uh, for, from the surgical perspective because I was dumb enough to, if I hadn't have told them, they would have never known is the reality of it. No one would have ever asked, it, uh, but I was, was dumb enough to open my mouth and, and it was regrettable. So on that, you say that's the biggest high, like you, you were just riding on adrenaline. That's what gave you that personality. Now I want to go back to what we talked about before with not being able to save your friends. And that's the absolute low. And that changed your perspective. So I have to understand from you, because I ask a lot of people that are on the show, how in the hell do you balance those absolute highs and those devastating lows and even stay even kilter? Because it doesn't seem like it's possible to do. Yeah, it's odd, isn't it? And I think the at the time it was remarkably easy, which which I know sounds odd. It even sounds odd for me to hear myself say that. But when you and once again you, you're on that fast moving roller coaster, and everyone else around you is on the same roller coaster, which serves to normalise some very abnormal stuff. And this isn't unique to military. This certainly isn't unique to me. This is every cop, every fiery, every AMBO, every correctional services officer, every emergency department staff, ER staff, the list goes on. If you get exposed enough to these abnormal exposures, you, you normalize them. You're like, well, you know, and there was a period there where it's like, well, this is what happens. So I, I recalibrated to, we, we are gonna go out, we're gonna get in these gunfights. And then I started to realize people are gonna get killed and normalized that. And then all of a sudden that wasn't as in the moment uh, unexpected or unpredictable or impactful. And I think the other thing which was crucial was the constant distraction. So that was very protective at the time. There was no time to sit around, reflect, digest what had happened, or uh, let alone start to process what had happened, because there was always another job to go to. And, you know, that, that instance that uh, really changed things where Brett struck that device the so there was there was three others injured in that blast thankfully nowhere near as bad as brett we worked on brett for maybe 30 or 40 minutes uh, and then uh, lost him stabilized the other bloke who who had some significant shrapnel wounds the other two had just had the well when i say just they had had the significant blast wave go through them but they weren't as injured from a, a shrapnel penetrating perspective but so you know did did all of our uh, stabilization of the others did a, a medical evacuation for the the most wounded of them couldn't get a second bird in because it was just too hot and so we we uh, ended up just walking out with with brett and the other lesser injured bloke out of the blast and but we got back to base finished the the process of, of body uh, sort of processing handing over to the authorities and by then it was maybe five in the morning i went back to to my room, uh, sort of scrubbed all the blood off my kit, refurbished my medical kit, had a shower, and then was back on an insertion helicopter at about six o'clock that morning to go do a, a DEA job. And, and we had another IED strike, another gunfight that, that day. And so, I mean, it, it just, the machine kept churning. It was, it went at such a pace that it was so distracting that it was quite protective with hindsight. And I guess, 
I naively thought that I could outrun a lot of this stuff, and and indeed I did for years and years. And it, it uh, for with a lot of it, it took it took until I discharged from the army for it to catch up with me. But I think the pace of the role, the support of those around us, the normalisation of these experiences because we were having them quite regularly, all of these things factored into this being remarkably easy in the moment to, to keep going. And I think to your question of how do you balance those high highs and low lows, I think in my mind, I when when we had these really low experiences, when I wasn't able to, to save a bloke or where I had a bad outcome at the Ford surgical team or you know the medical evacuation helicopter, I saw that what might balance that would be for me to have a good outcome next time round. So I, I sort of thought of this and it sounds silly for me to say out loud now, but like this set of celestial scales that, you know, bad stuff happens, but if I can keep playing the game and do more good stuff than bad stuff, if I can save more lives than, than are lost, then I'll come out of it mentally okay. That was, no, once again, naively how I, I viewed the whole thing. Well, and, and I want to bring up when you talk about that, at one point in the book, you say you had become robotic in response to death. That, when you say you normalized not normal situation looking back on it now do you really think being robotic to death is normal no of course not it's it's not at all and and this is part of that desensitization and it, this is a protective mechanism and once more this is not exclusive to you know me or, or us this is every cop every fiery every ambo anyone who spends enough time around death and human suffering it stops having its profound effect that it should uh, on us and that's a protective mechanism because if it if it was as devastating every time as it was maybe the first time you'd be an emotional wreck you, you wouldn't be able to do your role so there needs to be a degree of emotional distance but I, I, I feel I had gone to the extremes of that emotional distance where there was was certainly times where we had lost people either in the resuscitation rooms of these emergency departments, of uh, the Ford surgical teams or on the medical evacuation bird, you know, you tried your best to, to save these. And, and often there was a bit of distance there in that it might be a partner force soldier. I'm not suggesting for one second that it's, you know, you, that we can Absolutely. compare or somehow, you know, grade the, the value of different human lives. But for me personally, that was different to treating a say American or Australian soldier, which was different to treating one a person who I knew. You know that was my personal experience. It was easier to distance myself from a partner for a soldier or a, a local national, and so there was all these these experiences that that resulted in death where I didn't feel anything at all, and and sometimes I even felt like this positive sense in the end of it for. The fact that I'd done all my interventions, my medical interventions were all sound. Like I might have done things like a surgical airway or chest tubes or, you know, you're establishing cannulas or you're doing this, that or the other. You're putting on tourniquets, you're packing wounds, you're covering sucking chest wounds, you're decompressing chest, whatever it may be. It, I could get this sense of professional satisfaction from having done my medical interventions correctly and efficiently, but the person died. You get beaten by the injuries. And so you could have this odd experience where you'd walk away from this loss of human life feeling this positive sense of, of having had a good experience. And so there was some odd psychological programming going on there, which, which caused me some cause of reflection and some, some really deep dive into, you know, what, what was it and how could I possibly have have not had any response or heaven forbid had a positive response when there's a dead person at the end of this situation left me feeling a little inhuman, to be honest. When you're talking about all of this stuff, when you're figuring out how to deal with it, of course, this is, you know, has become very real for you. You have become, like you said, robotic and stuff. Like we talked about with the first deployment, when you go home, I'm sure you're even more different now. Yeah, that was a challenging period. So I was, it was a very different experience to that first time coming home. No one had died, had, had had a bit of a taste of what this thing was like, but hadn't kind of experienced it to the level that I felt I wanted to. The second tour, that was what I asked for and I got it. And now let's try and make sense of what's just happened. By that time, 
by, let me think when that was, 2011. So I'd left a very young, uh, our second son was, was about, I think he was about 10 days old when I deployed on that tour. So I came home to him as a six, seven month old. Our first son was, was maybe three or four at, at that point. So young, young family, this little baby who I really hadn't bonded with and, and so was coming home to our second son in this relatively scrambled mental state, which I, with hindsight, I think did affect my interactions with him as a, as a young person. And, and then, but what happened was I, I had a little bit of leave uh, and then all of a sudden the, the work machine started churning again. So I, I went away again. I went to Papua New Guinea for, I think, a couple of months and, and there was this, that and the other. And, and so I had this short period where I could do a bit of reflecting, a little bit of processing, try to reconnect with this, uh, with, with my wife and, and, you know, normal society, try and normalize things. And then I was away again. And then it sort of, you know, went from there, I was deployed again and then deployed again and on this training or that training or whatever else. And, and so the machine picked up pace again. And, and once again, I could keep running from this stuff. All right. When you say running, running from this stuff, I want to talk about, is it the second deployment when your wife moves back to uh, Adelaide? Yeah, she did. So we knew from the outset, I was, I'd, I'd spent some time at the second commando regiment. So 2009, 2010. So I'd done selection with the SAS regiment and, and then it was a pretty convoluted sort of a, a process from there. I'd been called back to my regular army unit to deploy with them. So I wasn't able to do uh, what's called the reinforcement cycle, the continuation training after selection with my cohort. Uh, so the intent was I'd go into a holding pattern and then go back on that, that reinforcement cycle at a time in the future. So I called back to my, my parent unit and deployed with them to, to Timor. Then that deployment got cut short. I got posted to second commando regiment to deploy with them, spent 2010 at, at second commando regiment and then knew I was headed uh, to SASR at the start of 2011. And so I knew I was going there and then I was going to deploy to Afghanistan very shortly after. So rather than move my wife and young family with this, this very young child at the start of that year, rather than moving them to Perth and then just leave them with no social support, she moved back to her hometown of Adelaide where we live again now. So she'd have a bit of support with the young kids in light of the fact that I wasn't going to be there in Perth anyway. And so, yeah, she'd moved back to Adelaide. Uh, I went to Perth to SASR deployed. I guess I understood. Okay, so this is second deployment, not second deployment to Afghanistan, just your second deployment after Timor. This is your first one into Afghanistan when she moves back to Adelaide, or is no? It was second. You, you're right. Yeah. Okay. So I, I done. Yeah, I did. Did Timor at the end of 2008. That was okay. Uh, first did Afghanistan in 09, and then this is now the start of 2011. Okay. So it was my third, third, third trip in in total. Second to Afghanistan. So here was the interesting part that I found in this part of the story, and I'm glad I understood the timeline. Then is you talk about her moving there and you say that it kind of cleared your conscience. She could have support and you could focus on the mission. You didn't need to worry about it. And then when you get back and you're done with that deployment and you say, well, what'd you do? And she said, I just cried a lot. That's got to yeah. affect you in some way. Even if you're a different person than when you left that second time, it's got to affect you somehow. I mean, you're a human being and to hear your wife did that for those months, does it change your focus at all? Does it harden you into your state? Does it cause tension? How do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, that actually, that situation where I, I said to her, what did you do while I was deployed? I mean, exactly as you said, at the time, I thought, this is great. You know, she'll be supported. She'll have people around her with the young kids. And, and so in my mind, I, we, we ticked that box. She'd be fine. She'd life would be roses. And, and that was a, that was a terribly insightless sort of view of what was happening there. I was completely naive, uh, ignorant. I've used those two terms a lot, but, but I think they, they do describe my, uh, mindset at the time to to her stress and the pressure of being fundamentally a single mum with two kids and this husband who's off in doing this job where people are, are, are getting 
killed and injured, you know, regularly. And so the, the pressure she was under, I did not recognise completely. And I had just seen that as great, you know, she'll, she'll be in Adelaide, she'll be supported, I don't need to worry about her, I can just get on with my business in Afghanistan. And that actual interaction that, you know, what did you do while I was deployed, that, that didn't happen when I first got back. That was years after the fact. That was sort of after I'd got out of the army. And I, I started to reflect and, and think, gee, I never even asked her what that period was like. I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> I was so absorbed in my own life selfishly that I, and so invested in my professional role I don't think I even asked, you know, how was your six months? Tell me all about it. I'm sure I told her all about my six months, but uh, never asked her. And, and it was years after the fact, after I discharged, where I, I looked back and I thought, you know, that was massive. I wonder how that was for her. And, and that was when I said to her, in that, in that six months when I was away, you're in Adelaide. She goes, I said, what did you do? And she just said to me, I cried. And it was absolutely heart-wrenching. It was just like a, a gut punch, this realization of what I had caused and this, you know, intense period of, of stress and overwhelm that I'd put her in and not even acknowledged at the time. If we could kind of move forward to your third and fourth deployments. Uh, and the reason I want to talk about those third and fourth ones, uh, you talk about in the book that you say towards the end that you couldn't even like satiate the desire for stuff to be happening. You have to understand you're a smart man. You have to understand physiologically, physically, mentally, all of these different things. You have to understand that you're changing to a completely different person than when you came into this. Is it sticking out in your head at all? I mean, you talk about having nightmares and not being able to sleep, constantly wanting that adrenaline push into your body. How are you dealing with this and how are you kind of explaining it to yourself and making it okay with yourself. Yeah, you'd, you'd think that, it, and thank you for the, the credit of calling me a relatively smart bloke. I, <laughs> I don't know well, what I wanted to counter <laughs> the uh, what you just said, so I wanted to do point <laughs> counterpoint to it. Uh, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And to, to be honest, at that time, I was largely insightless. I, and I, I reflect on this, and, and I kind of am dumbfounded by... The, the lack of insight, but I, I think it's, and I think it's a lot like that, that frog in boiling water type metaphor or analogy where, where if you, you know, apparently if you put a frog in water and then heat it up slowly, it doesn't realize it's getting hotter to the point where the water boils, frog dies. And, and I think in a lot of ways that explains why I wasn't really noticing at the time that, that I was starting to, to burn out and come apart, you know, and these things were starting to affect me, is that it had happened so slowly and insidiously that by the time I got to that point, I, the, you know, I was that frog and the water was starting to boil. And I also think that while there was a, a lot of negatives and stresses and critical incidents, all that sort of stuff with the role, there was so much good stuff, so much good stuff to, to balance it out. And, and there was so much personal satisfaction, professional satisfaction, so much adrenaline, these, you know, these flow state activities, these, these things that I could experience doing my military role that were so rewarding and so stimulating and, and made me feel great. I felt like I was really doing what I was put on the earth to do. So it, it, it balanced out in a way a lot of this negative stuff, or maybe took the focus off it. I, I don't know exactly how to explain that, but I think the other thing that, that really allowed it to be surprisingly easy to dismiss any of these negative aspects of it was that everyone else around me was experiencing the same thing. We were all in the same bubble and we'd kind of lost, I'd kind of lost track of what normal looked like. I was so, I'd moved so far from it over such a long period of time that I didn't really, there was no barometer telling me, hey, you've, you've moved off track. You know, I was just on the track I was on. Everyone around me was on that same track. So it seemed normal. And there was all those good things that were countering the bad. When I say physically, I mean, at one point you even had a mohawk, a huge beard. Like you did not look like a doctor. You know what I mean? Like you had become, in essence, and it happens a lot of time to people working undercover, 
You mm. become a different person, and that is the person who you think you are. You get so into that role. You get so much enjoyment and fulfillment out of that that you become this person that no one, maybe not even you, understand who they are. Yeah, and I think that while, while I don't have any personal experience in that undercover space, I, I know a number of police officers quite well who've worked undercover, and 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 I think there's some some interesting parallels there. And and I think once again across the board of these roles where you are hugely invested and you're having these experiences, there's there is that tendency to start playing a role, take on a persona that is the avatar that is is works well in that role and and maybe that's part of this sort of um desensitization this this dehumanization of of some of these abnormal experiences and yeah i can i can see now that that mohawked version of myself was probably that person it was just me kind of fully embracing this almost animal or monster version of myself that that was the right version of me in that capacity to be honest it, it was one that stripped away the all the empathy and sympathy and and just became this uh, sort of automaton if you like this 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 avatar that that suited in my mind that environment well and you you talk about that in the book the monster it's it's good that you brought that yeah. up about becoming that monster and kind of you know realizing who that is as you get close to the end though you had said that you always said whenever your wife told you it was time to go that's when it was time to go and she tells you that it's time to go is there any kind of friction there is there any kind of i don't think it's time to go yet there actually wasn't and i think the reason for that was I'd like to say it was because I respected my wife's opinion, you know, uh, supremely. That wasn't the case. I did absolutely respect my wife's opinion, and and that's why I think she felt comfortable enough at that point to say. And gee, God bless her. You know, if most I, I suspect most people would have pulled the pin, you know, years before that point and said, thrown the thrown the flag up and said, hey, this has got to stop. But this was so I'd gotten back from my fourth tour of Afghanistan. It was about a week before our third son was born. So once again, I'd left my wife at home for my, my third and fourth tours with two young kids heavily pregnant with our third. And so got home and it was actually just after my third son was born was was when she was still in hospital. And that was when we, we had that chat and she said, hey, you, you, you got you to gotta stop. This has got to stop. And so I was about mid-year uh, in 2013. So halfway through the year and the there was a lot of other factors that made that decision very easy to make. So for one, I, I had been dodging promotion for some years. I had um, deliberately sabotaged my career progression to allow me to stay at a rank and in roles where I could be deployed operationally because that was what I loved. And so I was I was years behind my, my military medical peers. I needed to go and do promotional jobs. I needed to post out of special operations. I probably was going to have to do a desk job as a senior medical officer for a while. So the, the actual career prospects were not appealing to me personally. I mean, that's a great career if that's your thing. It wasn't my thing. So, and the other factor was Afghanistan was winding up and that was really what had motivated me for years and years was doing that job. That's the thing that I found uh, really fulfilling was being a, a doctor with that organization in the, the pre-hospital space in Afghanistan. That was what I loved and that was going away. That was was not going to be there any longer. The writing was on the wall that we were coming out of Afghanistan. So there was a whole stack of reasons. And I think somewhere in the background there around that point, I started to realize that I was fried, that I was burnt out. And so all of that culminated in it being a very easy decision at that stage to discharge from the army. And even being fried, burnt out, I wouldn't say yours came to an abrupt end, but it, it it came pretty quickly. The end did. And and you even talk about when they let you back in to clear out your lockers and you saw the gate drop down. I mean, there, there was a lot of stuff that happened very abruptly, but here's the question that I have about that is that when it ends like that and you know, you're fried and you know, you're walking away. So do a lot of drug addicts. They know 
man, this is really messing me up. I'm at my end. But when you pull that away from them, yep. it goes into shock. And and I want to talk about as you transition out, you said there was a honeymoon phase where you're like, cool. But it's weird mm-hmm. to me that you say, I didn't want to have a desk job, you know, be a doctor. But when you get out, that stuff's gone. And that's what you're going to be as a doctor doing doctor things now. Yeah, I, I tried to dodge that. And so, yeah, there was definitely, I mean, my, my f- initial feeling was relief. It's like, wow, that's, you know, this is this is over. Um, so there, there was relief. I, I had, with hindsight, become quite cynical. I had uh, become maybe even a little insubordinate in my role. I was getting frustrated at things within the, the unit that that hadn't frustrated me before, and and I, I can see now that. Do you want to talk problem- about? Uh, do you want to talk about the training exercise where you <laughs> oh, you cowboyed yeah. up in the uh, AAR? <laughs> I talk I talk about it in the books. I mean, it's <laughs> out there, and and those that were there know exactly what happened. But this is another thing that I regret, and I can see was just a byproduct of my mindset at the time, but. I'll try and cut a long story short. We're on a counter-terrorist or a hostage hostage recovery training exercise. And, and I'd put forward, as I always would for these mission planning purposes, I put forward my med support plan. Um, it was theoretically a pretty remote uh, exercise to go and rescue these notional uh, hostages, bunch of terrorists, high risk. And, and so I'd put forward a med support plan accordingly and it got uh, dismissed. At, which at the time I, I, I took personally, you know, I, I, I saw it as the, the hierarchy and the commanding officer, you know, not taking medical seriously or even, you know, I took it more personally than that. They are dismissing my plan, you know, and, and of course that wasn't the case. What they were looking at is how many helicopters we got, how many bums can we put on seats, what gives us the best chance of mission success. And it wasn't my, you know, three-person med support plan. They they needed three more operators to give them the best chance of, of mission success. So, so I, I came to realise after the fact that it wasn't a scathing personal attack. It wasn't that they had just outright dismissed my opinion. It was that they had the unenviable position or the commanding officer had the unenviable position of looking at, well, We'd probably love to have a bunch of medical assets, but if that comes at the compromise of of mission success because we don't have enough operators, then we've got to we've got to stack it towards mission success, and that might mean we have a preventable death. And that's you know that's got to weigh heavy on leadership in special operations in any military or you know policing entity. But I took it personally. The the thing goes off and this training exercise, there was a couple of, of hiccups in it. The, the notional, uh, the medic, the one SAS medic who was on the thing, uh, you know, they were firing paint rounds and he was the first guy to get hit. He gets notionally, you know, killed by a, a shot in the face. So he's dead. They've got no dedicated medical e- elements there. They, they had a couple of other blokes shot. One of the hostages ended up, there was some confusion. The hostage got shot. And so I sort of saw this after action review as this opportunity to talk this through and say, hey, well, let's revisit my med support plan and and you know it was probably a bit of a uh, I thought it was a bit of an I told you so type opportunity <laughs> but but it just got glossed over and and I brought it back so it was this room full of pretty high ranking uh, you know special operations people aviators uh, members of the intelligence community I brought it back and I was very vocal and said hey hang on a sec let's back up let's talk about the casualties here and 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 I was I was quite uh, immature I was quite pedantic about this and and I I did make it personal with the the troop commander who was answering the questions and and it was unprofessional it was insubordinate regrettable but it was where I was at at the time in my mind I had seen that we'd gone through this period and I'd lived it where we were losing blokes on the battlefield and in my mind we should have been paying more attention to medical and I saw this as as just this ongoing dismissal of, of medical capability which it wasn't, that was my interpretation of it. And so I I cooked off in this after action review. And later on, uh, you know, the the executive officer of the unit actually pulled me aside and and he was the one that that pointed out to me in a very emotionally intelligent fashion, he could have by rights just dressed me down, but he didn't. He said, hey, look, this isn't personal. We do look at your med support plans. However, we need to balance that against, you know, operators, bums on seats, helicopters. And so it was sort of at that moment, sadly, at the very end of my career, 
that I really had that that uh, realization that this wasn't personal. It wasn't about me, and and it was about just the mission and best chance of mission success. And so sadly, that came very late. But but it was I think my state of being a bit fried and burnt out uh, just cooked over in that after action review, and I acted quite regrettably. I think it's very cool that at the end of your SAS training, you learned it wasn't about you. It was about the team. And at the end of your career, you got kind of the same lesson. I I just think it was a very cool parallel between the two at, at the end of your career, at the end of training to go into that. Now, after that honeymoon phase of transitioning out, um, you started drinking excessively. You did not fit in. You, you just kind of had a rough time coming out of it. Can we talk about that transition and how you finally just kind of picked up and moved on and said, okay, that's over. It's time to start this second chapter. Yeah, for sure. I, I think, and once again, not, not unique to, to me at all. And, and in many ways I had the best case scenario in transition and still had a, a rough time of it. But this, this period of transition we know is a really high stress period for any military member, any police officer, any first responder, any of these sort of organizations that we've we've spoken about, moving out of that is a real challenge and a real period of, of stress. And there's a, you know, the, the term transition stress is now being used. I don't think it's being used enough. There's a fantastic article. I think it came out in 2017 uh, by a um, author by the name of Megan Mobs. And I, I try and put anyone I can onto this. There was a second author whose name uh, escapes me, but the, the lead author was Mobs, and her her article was all around transition stress. And it was basically looking at, at in a military population, it's specific to, but I think it's relevant to uh, all these other emergency services, COPS, fire, Ambos. She looked at the post-traumatic stress, and absolutely that exists, of course, no question. And we, we can't sort of take any emphasis off that. But she looked past that and said, well, you know, the, these percentages of people coming out of the military that get stamped with a, a post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis are actually relatively small, but the, the amount of veterans that struggle are relatively large. And there was studies showing that, you know, up to 77% of veterans trying to transition out have this this hugely stressful period where they struggle, they can't relate all this stuff, and and so she started to. I, I think she coined the term. If she didn't, it's where I became aware of it. But started to use this term transition stress, and it's basically all this loss of identity, loss of purpose, loss of tribe, loss of self esteem, not fitting in, feeling lonely, uh, all this sort of stuff. And and it was what I experienced, and it can certainly leave you vulnerable so like this loss of resilience that comes with all of the loss of those factors leaves you vulnerable to post-traumatic stress to things catching up with you and that was my experience in that period transitioning but it was far more than just post-traumatic stress it was all this other stuff that that came with it and so just trying to work out who i was it, you know i had undergone what the psychologists call identity fusion. I saw myself as my work role. And while that was going well, I had this positive identity, I had good self-esteem, but it was all related to wearing that uniform. And I didn't realize that the prestige belonged to the job and not to me. And when I moved out of the job, I lost that identity, purpose, tribe, self-esteem. And coming back to our discussion earlier, I'd spent this 15 year period being part of the military in group, which made the civilians the out group, all of a sudden I was one again. I was a civilian and I didn't want to be. I had had sort of thought less of them uh, ignorantly as the, you know, used that term a number of times, but I, I was all of a sudden a civilian again, didn't know how to be, didn't want to be, couldn't relate. You know, even things like my sense of humor didn't align with, with the, the civilian population. <laughs> Civvies don't find me funny. You know, I could Crack it. Yeah, I see you laughing. Because the sort of jokes you'd tell to your cop mates that are riotously funny to other cops, you know, you try and tell them to a someone outside of the policing community and that you you know, you're probably gonna traumatize them with some of your experiences. So there was this this real disconnect, but my pace of life also slowed down abruptly and I was to to be honest, I was bored shitless. I was unstimulated, my body was used to be running at a million miles an hour. My stress hormones were, were ramped up and all of a sudden I didn't have stimulus to kind of burn those stress stress hormones off, if you like, and, and so I was bored shitless. 
how does that work with the family? Not well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so look, I, I was I was quite withdrawn, and I mean the the real if if there if if there is a, a hero at all in this story, it's my wife. I mean, she has been just this amazing presence throughout all of this, not only throughout all my time doing what I was doing, but then in transition at a point where you'd think, right, great, you know, my husband's home, he's here to help. All of a sudden you get this train wreck come home who then spends the next however many years trying to get themselves back on track before they can even be a decent contributing husband and father again in my instance. So, so you know, God bless her. She just, just basically cracked on, ran the household and, and put up with me while I tried to negotiate this whole process. But I, I certainly reflect on that period as a time where I was quite withdrawn. I was uh, quite, I wasn't a particularly good husband and certainly wasn't a very engaged father uh, at that stage. That, that came uh, and actually in a, an epiphany moment uh, sometime later, but for the first maybe year or so, I, I was really lost in that transition space. When you look back on it, how do you, okay, so how old are the kids right now uh, whenever you're going through this transition? So that I got out in 2014, so uh, I would have, they would have been, the youngest would have been seven, eight, some, uh, sorry, the eldest would have been seven, eight, somewhere around there. The, uh, the next guy down was three, and then the little man, so he'd been born mid the year prior, so he was six months old. Okay, so you have the seven, eight-year-old where they're pretty engaging at seven, eight years old. Three, you can still kind of get away with some stuff, but seven, eight, they're pretty engaging into your life. When you look back on it and now that you see it, how did it change with the three-year-old and the six-month-old as they came into the seven, eight time frame? It changed completely. And I think what changed was me finally understanding what it was like to be a parent, finally having that that visceral experience that people talk about when they talk about parenthood. And I, I look back now and I realize I didn't feel that with my first two kids. And that's, a, that's you know, there's a fair bit of shame associated with me saying that and realizing that. But the reason that, that I feel that way is because I was I was away so much. So A, I wasn't there to be having that bonding and all that good stuff that goes in, the, the highs and lows that goes into developing a relationship with a kid and allows you to feel that, that visceral experience of parenthood. I, I didn't get it. And I think the other thing was, and I don't know if this is true, but it's something I've considered that a lot of the time when people have have kids if if someone has a more you know a more normal life compared to my life when i had young kids it probably that having a kid is a massive event because it stands out so much from the background of their their lives and and i, I don't try and say any of this to sound elitist or special or or anything i just am reflecting on why i might not have felt that same experience that a parent should for my first two kids and what made me realize and, and because I had this other stuff that was going on in my, in my life that I was so drawn to and that was so stimulating and just so fulfilling that that having a kid was what didn't stand out as dramatically as it might have if I didn't have this special operations thing going on uh, but when when our third son was born I was home for pretty much all of his early life and so I had the chance to you know the highs and lows the to, to see him crawl for the first time and to do things and all the stages the changing the nappies the up all night when he had croup and was sick and the settling him when he was crying and you know all that sort of stuff that I hadn't had with the first two kids because I was doing what I was doing. And that was the, the point where I started to realize, holy shit, this is what I've missed. And initially there was just this absolute horror and this shame and this guilt that I had missed that with my first two kids. But that pretty, pretty quickly turned into, well, you can't get that time back. How can I start from now and do the best I can moving forward? And so that's what I've, I've tried to do from that point. Do you think that 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 guy, that soldier, that doctor in that combat zone, is that guy gone or is he still a part of you, you think? Nah, he's still there. <laughs> 
he he and this is the the you, you touched on then i mentioned the term monster and you picked up on it earlier that that's some work done by a psychologist called jordan peterson is where i became aware of of that specific term but i think in my mind it is a an elaboration on a psychiatrist by the name of Carl Jung, who who did some work around. He he referred to your shadow, this shadow self, and you know these whether it's your shadow or your monster. The the concept, as I interpret Jung's and Peterson's work, is this is that part of you that's capable of doing some some pretty. Uh, horrible things under the right circumstances, you know, that, that inner monster that, that only comes out in most people at their worst moment or under a severe stress kind of situation. This is the, you know, the, the, the full fight or flight that can, the mum that might be able to fight off an attacker because their kid's at, at risk and, and who wouldn't see themselves as that person normally, but it's within all of us is the concept that Jung and, and Peterson are making here. This is not someone different this isn't this is part of us you just need the right circumstances to bring that part of you out and when i reflect on my time uh, over that five years when i was rotating through afghanistan in the army I, I can see now that i embodied this shadow or this monster that became my norm is the way i view that i spent so long in those environments that i became that person and maybe that was this persona you know maybe this was the mohawked version of myself but i then transitioning back out i i, I realized over time that 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 person doesn't have a productive role in society again. As a civilian, I, I can't be that person. It's not appropriate. However, it's not about uh, sort of denying that that person exists or trying to suppress that person and, and push it push it away. And and this is where Peterson talks about not not denying these these aspects of ourselves, but embracing them and then controlling them. So he talks about being becoming your monster and then taming your monster. And and I like this. This works for me. It resonates. And and Jung talks about the same thing. He says, you know, have a look what's in the shadow there. Don't don't try and deny it or repress it. Have a look at that and then encompass that into you. That's how you become more whole. And so I would like to think that that person is still within me. I I know now that that they're under good control. I'm pretty sure it ain't going to come back out of me inappropriately. But equally, I I feel, and it, you know, you never know until you test it again. But I feel that should the circumstance arise where I have to step up and perform under high pressure, high stress, life or death type situations, I'd like to think that that in a monster, if you like, will be able to step up to the task and get the job done. Well, speaking about well-rounded, I need to talk about one more thing in your life that people might find interesting. It's the car that you drive. Uh, <laughs> it's it's very much a cowboy drive. Let's talk about your Lamborghini for a minute. Now, it's not just any Lamborghini. It's classic, and it's gone through some not great changes. Uh, it got a black paint <laughs> job at one point, but... Let's talk about that and how that is another part of what makes you an entire person. Yeah, look, that's I have always loved cars. So my, my brother and I grew up around classic cars. My dad was a classic car guy. So we were exposed to that from an early age. He, My dad loved old British cars. He had some MGs. Growing up, we had this this thing called a Triumph Stag, this V8 convertible thing, and and actually that I, I bought that off him when I first joined the army. That very car, I, I then owned this you know, car of my dad's, and so loved cars from the earliest age. We always had a car or two in various stages of disassembly around uh, our backyard and sheds, so that was all familiar. But for whatever reason, I gravitated towards love of Italian cars, particularly as a little kid. I had the little Matchbox, Lamborghinis, Ferraris, Alfa Romeos, you know, that I was drawn to that uh, as, as a lot of kids. My uh, vintage had the, the Countach poster on the wall and the Tessarossa poster on the wall. And so I loved that from the, from the outset. As soon as I started getting the means financially, I started buying sports cars and, and bought this thing off my dad and hotted it up and drove that for a while. And, and then this, I'd always wanted a Lamborghini. The Countach was the dream. But um, it was pretty clear on an army wage, I wasn't going to be able to afford that. <laughs> and so I started, started looking at, at what else was there. And, and this, this particular 
car that I ended up getting, a thing called a Uraco, which was kind of a poor man's Lambo. It was the, the unloved Lambo. It was a V8 instead of a V12. Lamborghini had built it to try and compete with Porsche 911 and Ferrari had a, a 308 series, which had a couple of little back seats. And so Lamborghini put this thing out. It was the, 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 the uh, base entry Lambo of the time. And, and so I started looking at these thinking, oh, maybe I could get my mitts on one of them. And, and one popped up for sale in Sydney when I was there. Worst possible time, we'd just doubled down and bought an investment property. We'd sort of stretched our lending capacity to the limits. And then this thing pops up. And, and I, I remember this really clearly. I think I talked to it in, in a book. Uh, but I was reversing my car out to go and have a look at this thing. I told my wife, I'd said to Christy, I said, look, I'm, I'm going to have, go have a look at this Lambo. She's like, don't buy the car. I'm like, no, 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 babe, I'm, I'm not going to buy it. And, and I was reversing my car out of our little carport. And I'm looking backwards, reversing, and I hear this bang on the bonnet. And I look forward, and Christy had come out the house, and she's banging on the car. I wind my window down, and she says to me, don't you buy that fucking car. <laughs> and so she, she knew before I did that I was buying the car. And anyway, went to this dealership, had a look, immediately knew I had to own it. Uh, took it for a test drive. It was clear that this thing's engine was hanging by a thread. It was going to need an engine rebuild. Uh, so put a deposit down on a credit card, had no idea how I was going to pay for it. I organized finance for this thing through about three or four different, uh, basically the, the sort of people that, that come with a baseball bat, not a clipboard if you default on payments. And, and I actually organized that through a satellite phone on a Navy ship off the east coast of Australia because I had to go away straight after this, uh, that I'd committed to buy this thing. And so I cobbled this finance together. It took me days to tell my wife after I bought it. Anyway, bought it, loved the thing. And, and it's been, so I've owned it since 09, that must have been. So um, near on 15 years now, uh, loved it to death. It's, it's had numerous kind of ups and downs, engine rebuilds, gearbox rebuilds. and. It was actually after that that 2011 tour where I got home and I was I was we'd, we'd lost the guys and you know the the reality of things had hit me. That was I got home and for whatever reason I decided this Lambo which was red when I bought it and had a pretty good paint job on it. I thought Lambo needs to be black, and so I had six weeks of leave to clear after that tour. And I pretty much spent every minute of every day of that six weeks in the garage, tearing my car down, sanding every panel inside and out and respraying it. Finally got it back together, resprayed, decided I'll, I'll just put some clear, it looked okay. It looked okay in black. I'd done a few resprays in the past. And so I was happy with how it had gone. Decided I'd put some clear coats on it to really bring out the shine. And the clear reacted with the black, the whole thing bubbled and it buggered the, the entire, six weeks worth of work and so had to go back to work and, and drive this thing that looked like, you know, it looked like it was covered in bloody rice bubbles. Uh, you know, the medics used, used to joke that it looked like it had bloody herpes. It just had all these dots all over it and, and it, it started to paint cracked and it rusted and paint peeled off. And, and so drove it for years and years with this shitty paint job before I finally stripped it back, resprayed it and, and uh, did a decent job of it. But no, that's kind of like a member of the family. I do love that thing. It's a, a great source of pleasure for me to drive that car. Yeah, you know, nothing says when your wife tells you not to buy a car to finance it through four people, <laughs> then tear it apart, spray paint it. Uh, I got it. Uh, let's talk about these books because I own two of them. I own Average 70 Kilogram Dickhead and The Combat <laughs> Doctor. But let's talk about The Resilience Shield 2. Let's just kind of go through them, give a brief overview and where people can find them at. Yeah, so Average 70 Kilo Dickhead, the, it's a, a tongue-in-cheek title. The, um, the explanation of that title was in the, the first chapter, but it was just designed as a bit of an attempt to, to write a book. It's a short book. It's short stories. There's lots of anecdotes, but just trying to capture a few lessons learned from my, my life, hopefully some motivational stuff in there. So that's a short, sharp one that I, I self-published. The Combat Doctor is was a, a, a formally published book and it, it started life as me writing down bits and pieces to try and process and make sense of it. So when I got home from that 2011 tour and I had my mandatory post-deployment psych debrief, the psych said, 
hey, have you thought about writing this stuff down to try and organize your thoughts, process events? And, and so I started doing that and, and that I found very cathartic and that sort of formed the skeleton of what eventually became Combat Doctor. So that tells my story sort of autobiographically of, of what we've spoken about today, growing up, getting into the army, into special operations, my time serving there, and then my transition out is the story that, that is captured in uh, Combat Doctor. The Resilience Shield, so I co-wrote that with my brother Ben, who we've spoken about, and another uh, SAS veteran called Tim Curtis, who ended up a squadron commander with the unit, so a senior officer with the unit. And the three of us, in that period of time when I was negotiating transition, I started to look at my own case uh, through that sort of psychological lens. I, I realised that I was pretty much just a shell of my former self, and I kind of started looking back and thinking, what were all these factors that were so protective about being part of the army, part of special operations? What had I lost when I discharged? And what was bolstering all of our resilience then? What had been stripped away from me? And that for me was gonna be the roadmap back to a good version of myself. So it sort of Resilience Shield started as a project for me to try and build a roadmap. What are the tangible things I need to be doing to rebuild myself? And then it evolved into this model of resilience. Uh, I got together with Ben and Tim, we developed it. I got a, a, a research project on the go with one of the universities here. So we validated the model, it's scientifically proven, we've published in scientific journals, all that sort of stuff. So we know it works and it's, in essence, it's a model of resilience that has six layers to it. So this innate layer, nature and nurture, the mind layer, the body layer, social layer, professional layer. And then there, there is actually another layer of thing called adaptation that goes around the outside, but that, that kind of, you get that for free if you practice you know, building resilience in the other layers. But it's, it's basically our reflections, our analysis of the scientific research, our research project, a bunch of vignettes about our military experience, experience of mates of ours, more broadly experience of, of uh, resilient people. And then this, this validated model, how we can, everyone can be deliberately and proactively building resilience day to day is the, the essence of Resilience Shield. All right. Where can people, if they want to know more about you, where can they find you? Social media, website. I know that there's danpronk.com, but is there other stuff? Yeah. So Dan, danpronk.com is, is uh, my, my personal website. Uh, out of that, you can subscribe. I, I do a, a thing called Friday First Responder. So a newsletter aimed at first responders talking about all this sort of stuff. So if you want to sign up to that, that's free through the website. Uh, I'm, I'm most active on LinkedIn and Instagram in terms of social media profiles. And the other website is uh, resilientshield.com. So that's, that's of course, the, that company's website, bunch of resources there. We've got a survey there, resilience survey that you can do to, to have a look at your resilience and some, some resources there. And then just, just a couple that are in the pipeline, one in particular called Aussie Frontline. So myself and a, a um, police officer, a, a Australian detective who I, I work quite closely with, is very passionate in this area. We're putting together some, some online courses that are about to go live through Aussie Frontline, uh, looking at one is, is specifically around transition and how to thrive in transition, talking about a lot of those psychological factors, things like sleep optimization for military and first responders. But, but that's the Aussie frontline piece. So it all sort of is the same themes. Last question. Are you completely comfortable in your skin or is there anything else that you still would like to grow as a person or still like to accomplish in your life? Look, I'm certainly much more comfortable in my skin than I think I ever have been in my life, to be honest. Uh, I, I still do have a lot of goals, but they are not as self-centered as they have been in the past. I am very focused and, and keen on trying to be the best dad that I, I possibly can, and there's always room for improvement there. So, I mean, 
you know, none of us are, are perfect and you know, I certainly am not, but, but very heavily invested in trying to be the best version of myself as a, as a dad uh, while my boys grow up through those teenage years as a husband. So, you know, there, there's certainly room for improvement there, but I'm, I'm far more invested. Professionally moving forward, the thing that really sort of lights my fire at the moment is this this veteran and, and first responder well-being space. I'm, I'm super passionate about that. And so that's become my new real focus of, of most of my professional goals is to try and engage in this space and, and hopefully use a little bit of, of my experience and lessons learned to shed a bit of light on, on some of these psychological factors that affect military and first responders. And, and so, yeah, that's professionally where I'm, I'm pushing at the moment. I'm in the middle of, of writing a book around transition and the transition stress piece. As I said, the online course is there. So professionally, that's the direction I, I want to head whilst keeping my clinical medicine ticking over as well. It was an amazing story. I'm, I'm so glad you came on here. Uh, fantastic book. You guys need to get your hands on it. It's in Kindle form. You can get the regular book. Whichever way you can do it, you can get it in audio with you actually narrating it yourself. Uh, it's it, it, I cannot say enough good things about it. It is an absolutely fantastic book. Now, we're coming to the end, and as you guys know, you know where to find Dan. Now, if you want to find me, you can always find me on Instagram at the DTD underscore podcast. You can find me on Facebook at the DTD podcast, and you can find us on YouTube where all these conversations are in video form. But the one-stop shop, it's dtdpodcast.net, audio, video. I have about 50 pictures of Dan on there on his episode page. It's going to give you all of his links, where you can find his books, and just find out more about him. Now that you know everywhere you can find me, let's talk about our supporters and our promoters. Mac Belt. It's our sponsor. He's my buddy. But I'm telling you, he makes the toughest belts on earth. They're hand cut from veg tan, full grain saddle leather. They're dyed to a classic saddle tan. They're contoured with black UV resistant parallel border stitch handmade right here in the USA by veterans and designed by former special forces operators. Everyone knows that Mac used to be a Navy SEAL. He's retired from that career and now he's trying to put the best belts that he can. They're perfect for everyday wear or any over the waistband or inside the waistband everyday carry. They're the finest quality American craftsmanship and they positively impact military charities. Make sure you go check them out at MacBelts.com. Now let's talk about coffee. Please Coffee. It's an officer-owned business. It's dedicated to crafting the finest coffees and blends and they're shipped as soon as they're made to provide you with the freshest coffee available. Each batch, it's roasted fresh by people who know what it means to stay vigilant. Their specialty coffees do not waste one drop when flavors is concerned. So let's talk about one of those flavors. One of the newest ones that they have out. One Ranger. It's the newest flavored coffee that you're sure to love. One Ranger is a flavorful, medium-bodied coffee with smooth and sweet pecan flavor. Now, as we all know, pecan coffee is probably the best combination in the world. It's rich, it's sweetie, nutty, and buttery, and the flavor cuts right through the coffee's natural acidity to give you a smooth and satisfying coffee experience. Go check it out. Pick up yours. They have K-Cups, they have whole bean, they have ground, everything that you could possibly think. It's at policecoffee.com. And when you go there, DJK10 will give you 10% off your order. Make sure you check out our sponsors, macbelts.com and policecoffee.com. Guys, that's going to bring us to the end of this story. Dan, thank you again for being here. We're going to get out of here, guys. That's Dan. I'm DJ. We'll catch you on the next one. See you later.